And turn to Romans 14. We're going to jump into Romans again. I'm really enjoying being genuine. I still, you have, I know that we'll be out of in October. So, at least a couple more weeks. Um, Romans 14, 12, here's what it says, and then we're going to pray. It says, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves. You know what that is? Us. Let me read that to you again. (laughs) So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Nobody else is going to do that for you. It's all about you. So we're going to talk about inevitable decisions. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much that you're going to speak to us this morning. That, Lord, that you're going to challenge us. That, Lord, that you're going to... Lord, you may even step on our toes. Amen. So we get them as stretched out as far as they can be. Yeah. And, Lord, we ask you to stop. Because, Lord, you're trying to get our attention. Because throughout this service, from beginning to end, Lord, you're talking about stoking the fire. You're talking about changing our lives. You're talking about us going deeper. You're talking to us to, about being the vessel. You're talking to us about being the witnesses. You're talking about to us about doing something big. You're talking about us being your hand extending. You're talking about miracles. You're talking about, and Lord, we just want to be that. So Lord, I'm asking you this morning, will you talk to us? Guide us through your scriptures as we talk about the inevitable decision. And Lord, may we be bold enough to listen. In your name, amen. Amen. See, we must learn to cooperate with the inevitable. Inevitable is things that you have really no control over. Some factors in life are just given, right? Some decisions are made for us. And no one asks us about them. They are acts of God. So let's look at a couple of those inevitable decisions. Number one, the first inevitable decision that you had no choice about. Aren't you lucky you thought you were total in control about? The very first thing that you had no choice in your life about is your birth. You had no choice who what you're going to be. You did not choose your parentage. You did not choose your parents. God actually said, whoop, there you are. There's your parents. You did not choose your race, nor did you choose your sex, no matter what the world thinks you can do today. We won't get into that. It's a whole nother subject. But anyways, you are who you are. Praise Jesus. Nor can you affect a change in your condition. In Jeremiah 13, 23, it asks this very question. It's very pertinent even today. It says, can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Great question today. John 3, 4, Nicodemus asks, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 27, it says, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his statue? Some things when, when done cannot be undone. There is no way to unscramble an egg. Have you ever tried that? All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Some things are just inevitable. Your birth is inevitable. You are here. You're perfect just the way you are. Another thing that you is inevitable You are sentenced 
to live. You are sentenced to live. And that sentence is to live responsibly. I used to hate that word. Someone says, you have to be responsible. You turn to a certain age and you have to be responsible. You get to vote when you're 18. Woo, you're responsible. You get to do this. You get to drive. You're responsible. You, you have to... Uh, when the milk container is empty, you got to throw it out. You're responsible. You, you got to pick up your underwear off the floor. You're responsible. You have to make your bed. You're responsible. You got to change the oil in your car. You're responsible. You got to do this. As an adult, you become responsible. As a baby, they just look at you and say, Well, you changed my diaper because they're not responsible. There are exceptions to be sure. We, we do not ex accept, expect God to hold a mental ill responsible for the capacity they do not have, do we? And we do not believe that God will hold children responsible for an understanding they do not have. But it is fair to assume that if you are hearing this with understanding, you are responsible. The Bible says that there is an age of accountability. I think you hit that. Each one in this place, I think you've hit the age of accountability. You're responsible to God. Yes. You've met that, that <coughs> criteria. There is no way to avoid responsibility. Some may try to escape by indifference, as did the man with one, the one town in Jesus' parable recording in Matthew 25. He hid his master's money safely in the earth, but he failed to do what, it, it, what the master wanted him to do. At the accounting, his master called him to both a wicked and lazy servant. Doing nothing is sin. Trying to escape the responsibility of life by indifference is wicked. Life is great. We like to live. We like to have the freedom to do whatever we want, but we're still responsible. So live life at its fullest. There's a verse in the Bible that says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. You have the permis permission to do whatever you want. Yes, but it's not really beneficial. Think about it. Do you think everything you do in life even though you can do it, the Nike commercial says just do it. Is that the right way to think of it? I can do what I want. I can do everything I want. But is it right? Is it responsible? Is, is it beneficial? Yes. You have to ask those questions as adults. You have to ask those questions for yourself. Pastor, you should not talk to me. I'm an adult. Don't treat me like a child. I'm not treating you like, I'm reading what scripture says that we're all responsible for the life that we live. So unfortunately in this day and age, adults don't always live responsible. Church, let us be the responsible people that God has called us to be. Number three, you are sentenced to live in a relationship to other people. Look to your left, look to your right. There's your sentence. You walk outside those doors, you're sentenced. You're sentenced to live alongside other people. In Romans 14, seven, it says this, for none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. We live alongside of people, whether we like them or not. But can I challenge you? If you say, I hate you, you know what you're really saying? In the Greek, the word hate means, I wish you were dead. My mom always says, don't use the word hate. I use the word hate several times. I hate vegetables. I wish they were dead. And they are dead. They're cooked. So they are dead, but I have to eat them. 
So the very fact is I hate vegetables, but the thing is, I'm not going to tell somebody I hate them because in the Greek it says I wish they were dead. So think about that. Next time you say, I hate you, you're saying, I wish you were dead. Everyone has the ability to have a relationship with God. God created us to have literally a relationship with him. He created man to have relationship with him. God placed us on the earth, placed us in this world that he created and gave us a spiritual nature like his own. We are a people with power to think. We have power to have a will. We have a power to act. He gave us the knowledge of right and wrong, a conscience that tells us what we ought to do. And literally, he revealed himself in, in, in the nature. Listen to a couple of them. I hope I have them up here because I think I put them in there. Psalms 19.1. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. <coughs> Romans 1, 18 through 20, it says this. It says, For the wrath of God revealed the heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them. God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. Do you see that very simple statement? They are without excuse. Here's another one. Acts 14, 15 through 17 says this. Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to, li the, to a living God who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in it, in them. In past generation, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful season, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Very nature. In, hu in human nature, we see John 1, 9. Listen, John 1, 9, in human nature, it says the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. His nature was coming, his human nature. Romans 2, 14 through 16 says this. It says, for when Gentiles who do not know have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are the law, a law to themselves. Even though they do not have the law, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse of and or even excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of man by Christ. Listen, in a final and complete revelation, he reveals himself in Christ Jesus. See, God, the Holy Spirit, invites every person into salvation and warns them against rejecting the grace of God. See, the very fact is Jesus came to this world and lived on this earth amongst us, and this is human nature. We have to understand that he came and gave us the, the, the ability to have salvation. He, he gave us the ability to have everything that he has for us. But so many times that we forget that he wants to have a relationship with us. There's a song that we sing, we are a friend of God. But we don't have, we sometimes disassociate ourselves with that friendship because we have another agenda. Remember I talked about being responsible? We are responsible with that relationship with Christ. What we do with it every single day, Amen. Hallelujah. Here, here's another thing. Everyone has a relationship to other people. 
Hallelujah. Those around you, we have a uh, everyone, we have a relationship to other people. There is no way one can live without influencing or being influenced by other people. Listen, we're all influenced by somebody. I make my own trend. Whatever. Everybody is influenced by somebody else. Yeah. I mean, there is no today you are influenced by somebody. We should influence. There's a statement, you are either the influencer or the influence E. For Christ, we should be the influencer. You know, we're going to be in situations we have a choice to make, right? This brings me to the next passage of Scripture. It says in Romans 5, 14 through 16, a revised standard version, it says, A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a stand it gives light to all in the house. We have the ability, our responsibility is to influence, not to be influenced. Amen? Amen. We are going to come in contact with people all around us. And our ability, our responsibility is to influence, not to be influenced. Right? Did I say that right? Sure, whatever works. Yes. Your influence may be good, but sometimes your influence may be bad. But you will have the influence. It is the inevitable that you will have relationship with others. We all have relationship with others. We all come in contact with others. So you have to choose how your influence is going to be. Is it going to be a positive or is it going to be a negative influence? You have to choose. You'll love this one. The next influence we have is everyone will have relationship with oneself. Okay. Who's oneself? You. So, I'm going to give myself a hug today. I love myself. The second commandment is really simple. In Matthew 22, 39 says this. And the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Pretty simple. You knew I was going to go that one, huh? It is based on the assumption that people will love themselves. Unfortunately, in today's society, we're not always like that. We don't always love ourselves. We wake up in the morning, we look like we combed our hair with a pillow, and we say, ah, oh! and then we brush our teeth, we comb our hair, we say, ah, oh, I'm, I'm pretty again. I'm so pretty, so very pretty. And, and the very fact is we, we, we love ourselves. But all people are responsible for their own choices, whether they love or hate themselves. Their choices concern their lives are inevitable. People may be good or bad stewards of their lives. It's based on what you choose according to Scripture, according to life, according to what God has created. And God has created you, and you are the perfect picture of per perfection. Number four, you appear before God's judgment. Each one of us, talking about responsibility, we will appear before God's judgment. Each one of us. Nobody can save the person on your right or left. You and me will stand before the Lord based on our lives, and we will have to stand there. Good thing we have a great advocate. But still... If we have lived an unrepentant life and we have never changed, we still see that little old adage cartoon, there's a button and you go to hell. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. Yeah, that's right. Hebrews 9, 7, It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, judgment. I love it. I heard the other day that someone was telling me, Pastor, you judge me. I'm like, really? How do I judge you? And, and he couldn't really answer because he said, I was judging him because he hasn't been in church for a while. I said, I was just inviting you to church. And then he, then he did, you know, I'm like, I'm not trying to judge you. I'm just trying to tell you I miss you. You know, I find out it comes better from you guys when you see someone that's missing church. Because if I come up, they go, oh, <laughs> you're the pastor. You're out to get me. But if it comes from you, it doesn't come out so judgmental. 
So do me a favor. When you see someone not here, would you go ask them to come to church? Because if I come in, then I'm a judgmental pastor. I'd rather just love people. 1 Corinthians 5.10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Did you see that? We all? Everyone. We all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone will receive things done in his body according to what he has done. Which is good or bad. Can I ask you a question this morning? And you don't have to raise your hand because this would be embarrassing. Have you asked for forgiveness today? Have you repented from your sins? Have you said, God, I'm sorry? Because you know what? If God calls us home right now, will you be ready? Would you be ready to go through those pearly white gates? Would you say, yes, I'm ready, God? Because we're all going to be in judgment. It says that we're all going to be at the judgment throne. We're all going to be there. And I don't want you to not be able to get through the, the gates and, or, or, or I don't want you to go to hell. I want every single one of us to go to heaven and sit at the banquet, white, banquet table of Christ worshiping him. Yes. But we're all going to stand. I can't change that for anyone today. It says it's here in scripture that we're all going to stand. Yeah. Romans 14, 10 through 12 says this. It says, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will stand before judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Yes. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Each one of us. I cannot change that for any one of us. That is something that is strictly in Scripture. That is something that I wish that I could just say, you know what, I would go for you. But there's nothing I can change. You have to stand before God. The solemnity of the judgment, the account is to God. Matthew 25, 31 to 46 says this. It says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate the people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on the right, come, you who are blessed by the Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 35. For I was hungry and you gave me food and I was thirsty and you gave me drink and I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me and I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did you see, when did you see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and gave you drink? And when did we see you stranger and welcomed you and naked and clothed you? And when did you, we see you sick and, or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you as you did um, to, to the one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for, you, for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then, I will, then he will answer them, say, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And the, these will go away into the eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Think about that. Think about that. 
There's judgment. Are you ready? Everyone, every one of us shall give an account. All the people will be gathered before him and all who ever lived will present without exception. The individuality of the judgment is every one of us will give an account. The fairness of the judgment is he's going to look at each one of us and say, here's your record. Did you do right? Did you live your life according to my scripture? Did you clothe me when I was naked? Did you feed me when, when I was hungry? Did you clothe me when I was naked? Did you visit me? You did unto the least of these, you do unto me. It's fair. The fairness of the judgment, the the judge is a just God. God is in Christ is the judge. He will judge righteously and will not hold anyone responsible for what he or she could not prevent. Romans 5.13, sin is not in imputed when there is no law. God will not condemn me for Adam's sin, nor for yours. You are on your own sin nature. You are standing on what you've done. I am not giving an account for what you've done. You stand before God for what you've done. I will stand for God for what I've done. So church, friends, don't leave here without asking God to change your life. God wants to speak to you. Are you listening? The judgment knows all facts. He will need to summon witnesses and cross-examine for all the acts. Hebrews 4.13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifested in his sight, but all things are naked and open until the eyes of him and whom he, we have to do. Hebrews 14, 14, 14, Hebrews 4.13, None will fool God. People think they can get away with it. God is not someone to be fooled. Galatians 6, 7 says, God is not mocked for... Here we go. God is not... Do not deceive. God is not mocked for whatever one sows. That will he also reap. The first matter of inquiry will be, what kind of person are you? Answer that. Nobody can answer that for you but yourself. Hallelujah. There are several verses for this. So the very first question you need to ask you, ask of yourself, what kind of person are you? Talked about a lot of things this morning. But I I, I close with this this statement. We're all going to stand before God. I said that you are sentenced to be born. You are sentenced to live responsibly, to die, to appear in judgment, to live eternally in heaven or in hell. So let me me bring this back home. Why don't you make your life worthwhile? Why Why don't you make your life worthwhile and live for Jesus? Why don't you turn around and make sure you know you're going to heaven and and not to hell? Because we're all going to stand in judgment one of these days. And let me tell you, heaven's a whole lot better than hell. You say, well, pastor, you know, the Bible is a whole lot of rules. Can I tell you, hell is a whole lot of rules, too. Some people say hell is just a big party. Hell's a lot of burning flesh and pain. Heaven's a lot of glory. Can I ask you, my friend, how are you living? How are you living? Are you living for Christ or are you living for yourself? You, you might say, well, I've been saved before and I fell away. I turned, I did my own thing. I lived for self for so long. Well, you know what? You can change that today. 
See, I don't believe in the once saved, always thing that says, you know, I accept Christ and now look at me. I can just keep messing around and doing the things I do. And at the last moment, I can just accept Jesus Christ and he'll forgive me. Yes, that's true. But why would you play Russian roulette with your life? Yeah. Why don't you just accept him and live for him right now? Yeah. What's the problem? Know where you're going to go today. Yes. Know where you're going to go this moment. God can change your life right now. The very fact that in my life I have accepted Jesus a multitude of times. Why? Because God has made me an imperfect creation in an imperfect world. I'm a sinner fallen short of the glory of God. I'm saved by grace, set free, and delivered. Yeah. What about you? I stand up here not saying, condemning anyone, but the Bible says that you condemn yourself. Yeah. And so I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, it's between you and the Father. If you're here this morning, you say, well, I'm here and I need Jesus. I've walked away from him or I need him for the first time. I'm not going to ask uh, anyone to move around. I'm just going to ask, is it you? How are you living? You say, that's me, Pastor. I need Jesus in my heart. I need to ask Jesus in my life right now. Just raise your hand saying, that's me. Just lift your hand. It's your opportunity. Are you, how are you living? Thank you. I'll give it a few more seconds. How are you living? Hallelujah. If you're here living right, then you should be doing something else. You should be a missionary to that mission field. You should be the one that's responsible for those around you. But I want to ask everyone to stand and, and say this prayer with me. Will you, will you just stand? Dear Jesus, forgive me for all my sins. I'm sorry for living for myself. I'm sorry for committing sins. This day, I commit my life to you. Turning away from my old life and turning to you. Will you come in my life as my king, as my Lord, as my Savior? In your name, amen. Let me pray for you guys. Lord, I pray for each one in this house that, Lord, many people, Lord, have a strong relationship with you. Lord, may we be the people that are the testimony the influencers for you. Yes. That, Lord, that we'll be the world changers yes. for you. That, Lord, that we will be the people that invite people because we have a strong relationship with you and we don't want to see anyone go to hell. Help us to be those kind of people. Yes. Help us to have that spiritual boldness that that day when we got saved and we accepted you into our hearts and we said, we can overtake this world for you, Lord. <coughs> And just throughout history, throughout our life walking with you, we just kind of just kind of settled back and just kind of rode out our Christian walk. But Lord, may we renew that commitment to you one more time. Yes. Saying, Lord, I want to be a world changer. I want to be what you call me to be. And Lord, I pray a blessing upon each person. Lord, may we do what you call us to do. Thank you, Lord. Bless my friends. Bless my church family. Bring us back tonight as we learn from your scriptures as godly men and godly women. In your name, amen. amen. God bless you.